Well, let's do something radical. Let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Well, Father, we thank you this evening for who you are. And we seek to understand that even further. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the privilege of gathering together as we do this night to open your word to our lives, and we'd ask you to open our hearts to your word, that through your Holy Spirit we might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, that we might more fully apprehend what it is you'd have of us in these days that remain as we commit ourselves this night into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Well, we're studying a book of Revelation. And uh, it's one of my favorite books for several reasons, not the least of which it's the only book in the Bible that has the audacity to say, read me, I'm special. No other book in the Bible says to, has a commandment to read that particular book. Read the Bible, read the Word of God, great, many places. Only one book says, read me, and you get a special blessing. And, and we're going to claim that, ble- that blessing tonight. Third verse, the first chapter is one of the places that says... We are in session 18 of what will be about 24 sessions, and tonight we're taking chapter 13, which deals with the two beasts. And uh, the book of Revelation is one of the few books in the Bible that has its own outline. uh, At the end of, next to the last verse of chapter 1, John is commanded to write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are and the things which shall be metatauta after these things. By the time you get to this verse, he has just seen a vision of the risen Lord. That's what he had seen. From the point of view of the penman, that's what passed. And write the things which are. He then will follow with two chapters that are the two most important chapters in the book, in my judgment. That's the, the seven letters to seven churches. Write the things which are. Then... He says, write the things which shall be hereafter. The vision of Christ, chapter 1, is the first part. The seven churches, chapters 2 and 3, is the second section. And we obviously are in the third section, that which follows after the churches, chapters 4 through 22. And uh, it's interesting, chapter 4, verse 1, opens up with the word metatauta. After this, it's translated in English, metatauta. Hereafter these things, I looked and behold, a door was opened. We hold the view, for reasons that we covered when we were in this particular passage, that this represents a milestone of the rapture. John is treated by, to a preview. A tra- he was transported forward in time to that event. And uh, John says, I looked, behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. There's that word again, metatauta. So from chapter 4, verse 1, through chapter 19 of this book, we believe that it is an expansion of the last four verses of Daniel chapter 9. So as background, of course, um, you should uh, take the occasion you can to review that. As we plunge into the book, we discover it has a sevenfold structure. When the Lamb takes the book, it has seven seals. And uh, uh, we notice that in each group of seven... The heptatic is just a fancy word for sevenfold. There's always six, and then a parenthesis, and then the seventh. In uh, chapter six, we have the six of those seals opened, and then we have a sort of a change of subject, a pause, catching your breath, as it were, as another subject is dealt with. And chapter seven deals with the sealing of twelve thousand reach of the twelve tribes of Israel. One of the things I want you sensitized to is from chapter four on, the book is very Jewish. It's very interesting to realize that the labels of Christ and all the identities that are used in chapters 2 and 3 with the churches are unique, but from chapter uh, 4 on, I want you sensitized to the Jewishness. We find 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes of Israel sealed in chapter 7 and so forth. As you read the book, uh, we'll try to highlight that as we go. We get to uh, the seventh seal, you discover that's made up in effect, or leads to, seven trumpets, seven trumpet judgments. Don't confuse these with uh, other trumpets, there's trumpet judgments. And there again, we have six of them, and then there's a pause before taking on the seventh. This parenthesis consists of five chapters, 10 through 14. And uh, that's where we are, we're in this parenthesis, which is sort of a pause and an overview kind of series 
that we'll be looking uh, at tonight. And when we get through the seventh, we'll discover it will lead to, after this parenthesis, that'll lead to seven bold judgments poured out. And even there, between, many people miss, between the sixth and seventh, there's just a one or two verse parenthesis again. But it, the, 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 it's interesting to understand the architecture of this book. And uh, we, of course, are in this parenthetical passage there. We've been through chapter 10, the little book and the seven thunders. And then we talked about, then we went to the uh, temple and the two witnesses. That was time before last. And uh, uh, we talked about the different views of the temple that will be rebuilt. We know it will be because Paul, John, and, and uh, uh, Jesus all make reference to it standing in these t times. This, the passage from chapter 4 through chapter 19 is an expansion of what's the scholars would call the 70th week of Daniel. 77s were given to him as a prophecy. 69 were fulfilled. Then there's an interval with the number of things. There's a last seven-year period that is going to, apparently, we believe, is going to be triggered fairly soon. And uh, anyway, we know the temple will be standing by the middle of that seven-year period. There are three views. The traditional view that it stands at the Dome of the Rock. We talked about that. The northern conjecture is exemplified by Dr. Uh, 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 Asher Kaufman. And the southern conjecture, which is the one that most scientists are beginning to support. We really won't know which one's resolved until we can do serious archaeology on the mount. We talked about the two witnesses, subject of a lot of speculation. And we take the view here that the two are Elijah. Most, pe most scholars would agree with that. And uh, because of the four powers that are specifically donated, denoted in uh, chapter 11, Elijah uh, had two of those and Moses had the other two. And... Uh, so for reasons that we won't repeat all, but we, 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 held, we think they're literally Moses and Elijah. We suspect that the two men that are seen at the, at, the, uh, at the tomb, at the resurrection, the two men, not angels, men, check your scripture, uh, at the ascension, may also be the same two witnesses. But in any case, uh, we did that last time, uh, then we went, or the time before last, then we went to chapter 12, a very pivotal chapter in the entire book. And I want to set the stage here because chapter 13 is really a, uh, an echo of, of chapter 12, in a sense. Chapter 12 is a summary of Israel. The woman of chapter 12 is clearly Israel, uh, who brings forth a man-child and is attacked by the adversary, this, the red dragon. The woman, we believe, is, is not the church, as some people try to make, uh, for lots of reasons. Clearly, it's Israel. She gives birth to the man-child. And uh, uh, we, we developed uh, that whole reasons we believe it's, uh, this is one of those things that's very, very important for you to satisfy yourself as to that identity. So I encourage you to do the study and come to your own conclusions. It's the, the woman is Israel in the sense that it began in Genesis 3, the seed of the woman. And remember now, in Genesis 3.15, there are two seeds, the seed of the woman, which becomes the title of Jesus Christ, and the seed of the serpent. Two seeds. And it's interesting to realize that the seed of the serpent, among other things, is attacking the woman. Both the woman idiomatically in this chapter, but also women in general. When we talk about Allah, notice what Allah does to women. We'll go on to that. Well, we talked a little bit about one of the important significances of chapter 12. In fact, um, your whole understanding of the book of Revelation hangs on really understand, uh, seeing, perceiving the role of Israel in God's program. And uh, the reason I emphasize this, that there are many people, it's been commonly taught in, in many places, that somehow Israel forfeited her pro uh, the promises to her when she rejected her Messiah, and those promises devolve on the church. That's a very common theology that happens to be very non-biblical. And uh, this is uh, that, that uh, when she rejected, <coughs> when Israel rejected her Messiah, she forfeited the promises. The problem is those promises, the promises we're talking about are unconditional. She couldn't forward them if they tried. And uh, thus these promises presumably devolve upon the church. This looks like a rather innocuous heresy. It's not. It's very, very dangerous. Israel appears 75 times in the New Testament in 73 verses, and every one of them, including Genesis, uh, Galatians 6.16, refers to national Israel. And uh, there are major problems that emerge from this because the promises we're talking about we're unconditional. You need to understand the covenant that every one of us in this room that have a benefit before the throne of God do so because of the covenant with Abraham. We need to understand that. It all derives from that. 
Paul, in this definitive statement of Christian doctrine we call the book of Romans, hammers away for three chapters, chapters 9, 10, 11, that God is not finished with Israel. She has a very pivotal uh, place in God, <coughs> God's plan of redemption. The seven-week prophecy, which is so pivotal to understanding all of both Old and New Testament end-time prophecy, um, outlines the prophetic role of Israel very clearly. And, uh, and, and Jesus has yet to fulfill the promise that Gabriel gave Mary at the birth, that her child would sit on the throne of David. That is yet to happen. And uh, so how do we go from Augustine to Auschwitz to Armageddon through this doctrine? Oregon established an uh, allegorical interpretation style, which Augustine picked up and developed an amillennial theology we'll talk a lot more about when we get to Revelation chapter 20. And out of that, the medieval church and its quest for temporal power embraced that. The Reformation did a lot of wonderful things, but failed to readdress their eschatology. And so those ideas con con continued in most denominational churches, which led for, to the Holocaust in Germany, among other things. If you want to blame someone for the Holocaust in Germany, don't overlook the silent pulpits that let it happen because of these, this kind of doctrine. And the tragedy, the reason I'm emphasizing it, this is going to happen again. In fact, even worse. That's why it's called the Great Tribulation. And uh, now this man-child is the one that rules with a rod of iron to make this identity. It shouldn't be difficult for any of us here from Psalm 2, Revel Revelation uh, 2, um, Revelation 12, Revelation 19. Clearly the the one that rules the nations with a rod of iron is who? I can't hear you. Jesus Christ, exactly. So, she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to His throne. And most people take for granted that what that's referring to is the ascension of Christ during His ministry. And it was G. H. Pember, I believe, was the first to consider an alternative possibility. The word caught up in the Greek there is a familiar word to us now. It's harpazo. And uh, to seize, carry off by force. That doesn't exactly describe the ascension, does it? And uh, so there are many that suspect what's in, in view here is the uh, rapture. You say, well, that was just one person. So is the rapture. It's the body of Christ. So I'll let you think about that and come to your own thoughts about that. But tonight, with this background, we now come to Chapter 13 is our main subject tonight. Now we've had, we talked about the woman, the man-child, the red dragon, Michael, and the remnant. Those were all last time. In chapter 13, we've got a beast out of the sea and a beast out of the earth. So how many personages are embraced in these chapters 12 and 13? Seven. What a coincidence. I don't think that you can, no matter how many lists you make of the sevens in the book of Revelation, they're inexhaustible. I've done that many times, and you always end up discovering a couple more if you look hard enough. So it's an it's a interesting exercise. But these two beasts of uh, chapter 13 are our subject tonight. F to complete the seven personages that are in this parenthesis between uh, the uh, uh, sixth and seventh trumpets. Are we together? Okay. There's a conflict between two seeds, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. That starts in Genesis 3.15 and obviously alludes to the red dragon, Satan, identified verse 9 of chapter 12 last time, who is going to bring forth the coming world leader. I'll use that title. There are 33 others that we could use from the Old Testament alone. And he has a sidekick by the, what that is, seems to be called the false prophet. The point is that um, these three which some people would dub as a satanic trinity, Satan in his aspiring in the role of the Father, the coming world leader being his false Messiah, if you will, and the false prophet being his John the Baptist or Holy Spirit, however you want to do that. Um, the, 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 many scholars refer to these three as a satanic trinity. And, uh, but in any case, the coming world leader and the false prophet are the subject here in cha of chapter 13. So let's just jump in. Chapter 13, verse 1. We start off with a manuscript problem, because there's a, a, a minor mistake here. Um, the way it reads in your Bible is, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his crowns the name of blasphemy. And by the way, the crowns here are diadems, not Stephanos. 
with Christians that it's a Stephanos, it's the reward for performance, it's a, a reward like a, a Olympic thing kind of thing. No, these are diadems, these are ruling crowns. But uh, the first point is this word I is a mistake. This actually, there are manuscripts which, manuscript evidence that indicates this really should be the last, including the last for, uh, verse of chapter 12. But in any case, the I is a he. It's, not, it's a second person, not first person. So he stood upon the sand. The, 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 that is the beast that John saw. In other words, John saw this beast that stood on the sand of the sea and so forth, having seven heads. And sea. It's a small point, but so you don't get confused. It's not John that stood on the sand of the sea. It's John saw the one standing on the sand of the sea. And one can make the argument that pronoun actually refers to Satan. But whether Satan or Satan's man, we won't split hairs. We'll just keep moving here. Um, the name, the word here, beast, is Therion, which is a beast, a voracious beast. That's one reason when we translate the earlier chapters with the living creatures that are before the throne. Your English Bible uses the word beast there, because the, but the Greek word is zoa, not Therion. And uh, so uh, uh, it's, a, it's a misleading because the word beast in our vernacular sen, tends to sound ferocious and negative. It is here, and it should be, but it isn't with what, that's why we usually use the term living creatures in chapter 4 and 5. In any case, um, this is implied as like a beast of prey, in contrast to the word zoa from the others. Now, because this beast, this first beast, is out of the sea, the second will be out of the earth, there are many scholars that presume or uh, suspect that this may be a Gentile. One of the great debates about the Antichrist is he, is he a Gentile or a Jew? Well, you've got to remember, first of all, it's a duet. It's not a single guy. There's two of them. But uh, many commentators, and I wouldn't make a big case of this, as you want, just be aware of it, tend to see this guy as a, a Gentile. And because the sea is usually identified with peoples, that's, that allusion is made several times in, in the, the Bible and several times in the book of Revelation that we'll note when we get there. But for that reason, many view him as a, uh, uh, this first beast, as a Gentile political ruler. He has uh, seven heads, ten horns upon his head, and uh, the, it says, The beast that I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as a feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. These allusions, both verse 1 and 2, echo Daniel chapter 7. It, uh, you, that uh, we've reviewed several times in the study so far. It's interesting that we have these three creatures. They're in the inverse order than they show up in Daniel. Some uh, commentators speculate that's because we're looking back rather than looking. Daniel was looking forward. Here he's looking back. Who knows? Because the order is reversed. But um, the, cl these aspects of the leopard, bear, and lion are several. If you, the lion communicates arrogantly, with authority, or, uh, and uh, the bear, and indeed Nebuchadnezzar, you may recall from Daniel chapter 4 and others, was very, uh, characterized by his arrogance and pride. The bear controls extensively. The bear referred to the Persian Empire, you may recall, which controlled a wider extent than any of the others. And uh, the uh, leopard conquers swiftly. You remember that was the allusion in Daniel 8 and elsewhere to the career of Alexander the Great. So there's, those attributes uh, from the Daniel study may echo here. Uh, you can do your own study and come to your own conclusions. But John says, I saw one of the heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. Now, here's where most commentators take one of two different views. There are many of the good commentators, good conservative commentators, that feel that the heads are a government or a, an entity. Others feel that this head wound is literal to a person. It's very possible that both attributes can be true. But clearly, <clears throat> the more we watch this idiom emerge at least three or four times in the, in the text, the more it seems we're talking about a person's head wound. I'll show you why I lean that way. I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to the death. See, one of the problems, by the way, the word for king and kingdom is identical. It's um, uh, just like the dictator says, I am the state. 
the state and the person are really, in a sense, in, in as many, many visions, inseparable. And that's what leads to some of the confusion, I think. But anyway, I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to the death, and his deadly wound was healed. In other words, he apparently was wounded as if dead, and uh, his deadly wound was healed. Now, some scholars feel he actually died and came back to life. There's some theological problems with that one. I won't go down that path. But in any case, the world thinks he's dead, but he apparently is healed. And all the world is astonished at his return. Now, some people will take those words and try to apply them to an, to an empire that left and is now back, and that may be valid. We'll, we'll go further. But the thing that strikes me as we get into the text, this head wound becomes a major identifier of this leader. That's why I take it very literally, and I'll show you some other reasons too. Uh, there is a physical description of the Antichrist, as we would call him, in the Old Testament. The last verse of Zechariah chapter 11 has a very strange little verse in it referring to this coming world leader. Here he's called the idol shepherd, not idol like lazy, idol like false worship, I-D-O-L. Woe to the idol shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. This is one of these little enigmas that lace the book of Zechariah. He's got a number of these little uh, gems tucked away in various corners. That's all it says. What do you do with that? Don't know. But it seems to be an allusion to this final world leader, and, I, and the fact that he apparently has an injury that leaves him with one arm incapacitated and one eye incapacitated is important enough to be here mentioned, and it may explain why it is that his followers will identify him by taking a mark on his hand or on their forehead, or both. Go moving on, it says, And they worshipped the dragon which gave power to the beast. This leader is going to be satanically empowered, no surprise. Many of us could make a list of people that we believe are satanically empowered today. But notice this. They worshipped the dragon. Who's the dragon? Revelation 20 verse 9 identifies that unequivocally. They worshipped the dragon which gave power to the beast. In other words, his followers are going to be Satan worshippers. Are there Satan worshippers today? All kinds. Let me tell you candidly one of their names that you'll hear about all the time. That's Allah. That's Satan worship. They, wouldn't, they won't like to admit that for lots of reasons. But if you do your homework, read the Quran, and find out the background, you'll understand what I'm talking about here. The power of the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? This guy that's going to emerge is going to be satanically empowered, and the entire world is going to worship Satan because of his empowering him, and he will be, he'll appear to be invincible. And uh, we're going to find out as we get into this that he doesn't come up as a military leader, he comes up as a peacemaker, but he becomes militarily very powerful. Verse 5, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. If I was going to, th uh, th there's two identifiers of him. One is the head wound that I just mentioned. The other one, it's astonishing to me to make a list of the places where he is alluded to in the Old and the New Testament by uh, his primary characteristic is that he's shooting off his mouth. <laughs> Mr. Big Mouth would be a great label for him because all through Daniel, several times, he's boasting. Uh, Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2 makes that reference. Um, and here you'll find the same thing, it's emphasized. There was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. There's that, we've come across that again and again and again. 1260 days, 42 months, three and a half years, half of a seven year period. The, ho this, the most documented period of time in both the Old and the New Testament. You will not find any other period of time in the entire history of the universe that's more expressly nailed down more different ways than this peculiar period of time that I believe is on our horizon. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. There it goes again. And to blaspheme his name 
and his tabernacle. And guess what else? He blasphemes. He blasphemes the name of God. He blasphemes his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. How interesting. There's a group of people missing that are now in heaven that he's blaspheming. I think that's kind of interesting. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. And here's the surprise. And to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Jeremiah 30 verse 7 calls this period of time the time of Jacob's trouble. Because that's the focus. That's in Satan's agenda. But it's not limited to that. It's worldwide, all kindreds, tongues, and nations. You need to understand that to be a believer in this period of time means death. Gentiles are not protected in this period. Be believing Gentiles are killed. Now that's a strange contradiction. I'll come back to that later. But I want you to notice here in verse 7 of chapter 13 that this leader is going to overcome the saints. This, I want to say up front, don't jump to the conclusion that all saints are in the same category. There are saints in the Old Testament, all kinds, obviously. There are saints in the New Testament and subsequent, at Book of Acts and so forth. There are also saints in this period, and they, are, they have different characteristics. And uh, one of the ways, well, I'm going to have time to get on. Let's keep moving here for now. To overcome them. This group cannot, uh, is not protected. They're going to be overcome. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. That is this evil guy. I want you to be sensitive to this term, the earth dwellers. All through the book of Revelation, there's a consistent use of a group of people called earth dwellers, those that dwell upon the earth. You and I are not earth dwellers. We're, passing, we're pilgrims passing through. We're dealing here with those that dwell upon the earth. How do you know? They shall worship this guy whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. There's that, there's that phrase again. Interesting. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So this is section one of these two sections, making up chapter 13. The guy we've been talking about is obviously a political leader, very powerful. He's also worshipped. Um, he's commonly called the Antichrist. And I'll show you why that's an unfortunate label in many respects, but nevertheless, that's, uh, let's not fight that battle. But what everybody overlooks is there's two guys. This is only half the chapter. We're going to see another guy surface here. Beast number two. John says, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and spake as a dragon. Since he comes out of Eretz, or the earth, um, many scholars presume or suspect that this one may be Jewish. That may be so, maybe not. There's all kinds of debates. We'll touch about some of those things. But remember, there's two guys now. And he had two horns, or two sources of authority, like a lamb. In other words, simulating a lamb. Uh, two horns, uh, maybe one's political, one's religious. There's all kinds of conjectures, whatever. The horn is a classic idiom for authority or power, like a lamb. And he spake, though, as the dragon. So this is your, this is your uh, false leader. Here he's called the other beast. Throughout the rest of the scripture, he is alluded to as the false prophet. He's the one that's going to give, uh, uh, cause the people to worship the first guy. This guy may be a Jew in the minds of some scholars. They see allusions to, in Ezekiel 21 and Ezekiel 28 that would s support that conjecture. Daniel 11, 36 and 37 would support that conjecture. In John 5, 43, Jesus, says, Jesus said, I've come in my own name, and uh, uh, my, I've come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another come in his, will come in his own name, and him you will receive. Remember that, 5, 43. The word another there is uh, alos, not heteros implying another of the same, that would imply, that there's, uh, one can make a grammatical argument that that would imply he's Jewish. Not a, convincing, uh, a conclusive one, but a suggestive one. And in Psalm 55 and other passages, he's he, he obviously is received by Israel, strangely enough, which is another, some people argue that means he would have to be Jewish. There are rebuttals for all of these, I won't get into all that here. 
verse uh, 12. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So get the roles here. The second guy causes the rest of the world to worship beast number one. See, understand the difference. Uh, number one obviously gives him the power to do this. Um, he causes the earth and them which dwell therein. There again we have an allusion to the earth dwellers. To worship the first beast. And notice the identity that's used here again in verse 12. Whose deadly wound was healed. This again is suggestive to me that we're talking about a guy who had an apparently fatal wound that he, came, he, that he, uh, the, he gets healed from. Some scholars even conjecture that that's sort of like a false resurrection maybe. It's part of Satan's imitations here. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. See, he's duplicating the same thing God did in the Old Testament with Elijah and the rest. In other words, it's again Satan imitating. And by the way, when you start studying that kind of thing, realize that when Moses did those plagues in the book of Exodus, Pharaoh's ministers did likewise. They were able to do many similar things. And don't presume those were parlor tricks. You're, you're seeing occultic power unleashed there, but with limitations, of course. So that he make a fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which, which had the wound by a sword and did live. There again, we have this allusion to this head wound again. That's why I, I don't think this is idiomatic of an empire that disappeared and came back or some of the other conjectures. I think this is somehow a characteristic of that leader. But I want you to notice the deception. Satan's primary skill is deception. He deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by what? Miracles. Signs and wonders. You and I are not ready for this. The world's not ready for this. Can you imagine a political leader doing miracles? Real miracles, not parlor tricks. Jesus Christ did not rely on miracles for His authentication, but prophecy, the fact that it was all foretold. You do a careful study of that. It's dangerous to build your acceptance on signs and wonders. When you start looking at experience rather than the Word of God, you open yourself up for all kinds of deception on the one hand and a never-ending search for more and more signs and wonders. And this is going to climax by a signs and wonders specialist called the false prophet. He deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. This is foreshadowed in Daniel chapter 3. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar had this dream of all the empires in the form of a metal, big metal image, different metals and all that, chapter 2. By the time you get to chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar's on his ego trip and he gets talked into building an image, apparently like he had in his dream, except all gold, remember? And it forces them to worship and so forth. There's a whole, there's a whole um, um, parallel you can, you can draw between that whole episode in Daniel chapter 3 and these passages. And again, of course, he's identified by this head word and so forth. And he had the power to give life unto the image of the beast. Wow. Now, in our modern technology, that doesn't surprise us. I have no idea whether this is some kind of three-dimensional holographic thing or whatever, some kind of advanced thing, who knows. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the beast of the image should be killed. Again, this is analogous to what happened in Daniel chapter 3, when, uh, they, when the, the three young Jewish men didn't bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's band, that uh, they were thrown in the fiery furnace. And uh, the, the intent being that they would be killed. As would not worship the image of the beast, be killed. Okay. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand 
or in their foreheads. Strange place for Marx. That no man might buy or sell save he had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. This has led, this is the next verse, have led to more books going down where I believe is the wrong path. They missed the point. This is a karagma. It's a brand or a seal. His followers are going to willingly take on a brand that will manifest their allegiance to this leader. Okay? He's able to enforce that because he has economic control. Yes, you can't buy or sell or whatever unless you have his authority. It's got nothing to do, there's nothing wrong with having a credit card or a PIN number. That's not the point. It's not your number that's at issue, it's his. It's his number. A lot of Christians get all hung up with these barcode stories and sort of, I'll get to that in a minute. But first of all, I want you to understand, uh, well, let's go ahead here. A mark, by the way, in the Torah is prohibited. Leviticus 19 and 21, Deuteronomy 14, and a number of other places. According to the Old Testament perspective is you don't take marks on your person and uh, in, in anticipation of these issues, I believe. I want to go flash back now to this physical description that's in Zechariah 11:17. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. Is it right arm and right eye? Is that possible? His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. I visualize a leader like sort of Moshe Dayan. Now, by the way, it was left eye, so don't start starting. Don't start. I'm just using him as an example of someone, or uh, uh, John Wayne in True Grit, or whatever. There's a, an identity that one might take if you're trying to identify with that leader. You follow me? Now, and, and, and you take his mark on your right hand or on your forehead. Do you see what I'm getting at? Okay. Here is wisdom. Verse, the last verse of chapter 13 has spawned a library of speculations. Here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is six hundred, threescore, and six. Now people who know absolutely nothing else about the Bible all know that somehow 666 is the big thing, right? 666. In the Greek, the word Christos starts the first and last letter. If you take the first and last letter of those, and then there's another Greek letter that's like a little serpent, and put that right in the middle of it, you have what, uh, a, a, a designation for what is the Antichrist. But the word Antichrist is misleading. Because we think of Antichrist as someone who's against Christ. And indeed, this guy is against Christ, but that's not what the word Antichristos means. It means pseudo-Christ in the place of Christ. Do you see the difference? They're against Christ, yes, but more descriptive is the fact that he's putting himself in the place of Christ. Or a pseudo-Christ is perhaps a more uh, accurate translation of the way we would use the term. Well, if you take these three letters, the first, last, and the serpentine thing, you get, as you may know, Hebrew and Greek have the peculiar characteristic that each letter has a numerical value. The study of that's called gematria. And it's very interesting in the Hebrew for lots of reasons. It's also interesting in the Greek. These three letters have these values, 600, 60, and 6. And they, in the Greek, that's, that's a Greek way of saying 666. 6 is the number of man. Um, the, um, if you take the uh, all, if you take Roman numerals, you don't have all the letters. You have just a, a group of letters, six of them, that add up to, that, that do numerically for Roman numerals. If you take those letters and add them up, you know what they add up to? 666. Kind of interesting. Just a coincidence, probably. Um, if you take Arabic numbers from 1 through 6 squared, 36, and add them up, you get 666. So these are just numerical properties. Um, the number 6 in the Scripture clearly is used as the number of man. 7 is complete. Man is one deficient. Um, uh, and you can, you can go all through the Scripture and see examples of, of the six, sixes. Um, 
And by the way, so people, uh, because of this verse, people have tried to take all kinds of names and try to fit them in numerically. Except they don't use Greek or Hebrew necessarily, they use English, which is, English doesn't have that characteristic, they impute one and then try to make it work somewhere. But even if you take the Hebrew or Greek, you'll discover in Gematria, there are all kinds of Gematria. Regil is the normal one. There's another one, if you take the values plus the number of letters, that's another theory. Uh, Katan, if you take the small values, tens and hundreds, reduced to, you sum the digits and do what they call the reduced values. Or you can take the nominal values plus the values of each letter preceding it. You can go through all these different rules and it demonstrates what we used to call in the computer industry um, the principle that if you torture the data long enough, it'll confess to anything. You have people convinced that this, that this gematria refers to Caesar Nero. You'll find uh, Hitler, Napoleon. Um, you can go on and on and on. You can, you can probably find somebody that's found any prominent person tied to the 666 by some convoluted set of conjectures. But the, other, the real issue though, so you don't get on, uh, concerned about other things, whose number are we talking about? A lot of people are concerned about insertable chips because they're, they're being used for livestock and they're used for kids and people and other things. Um, uh, if you're on special ops, they can track you by satellite because you have an inserted signal. They know exactly where you are and so forth. RFID is a big thing coming. Little chips that are mi oh, very microscopic that don't need batteries to transmit. The ambient energy will cause it to transpond a serial number, which means that you can walk through a warehouse and take an inventory of what's in the warehouse. And there are companies that are uh, moving this direction, and as the costs get lower, they'll be more and more widespread, and it is a, it is a boon for uh, 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 reducing the costs of distribution. Also associated with these kinds of things are barcodes, and there's all kinds of people that get concerned because in barcodes, there's different, all kinds of different formats, but one of the primary ones uses a six as a separator sign. So at, the, at both ends in the middle, there's a six. And so you got a 666 on that card. Oh, wow, they get all unglued. You know, is that something to do with Revelation 13, 18? Uh, it may, it may not, but the point is, it's not the code on the product or the code on your wrist in the sense of who you are. What's at issue here is who he is. And the point is, if you willingly take on his name or number as a form of allegiance, you gain an uh, irreparable barrier to ever being saved. You're lost. Done. So you don't want to do that. It's his number and name that are the critical identity issues, not yours. He will be able to enforce you taking this on, it would seem, because of his control over electronic funds transfer, distribution, and probably a lot of other things. It's his political power that causes him to cause people to worship him. But the issue that indicts them is taking on this identity with him. And it's, a show, it's showdown time. And again, it's a, uh, I believe it ties to Zechariah 11, 17. Well, we call him the Antichrist. Actually, there are 33 different labels in the Old Testament alone. Um, and we're gonna, we won't go through all of these. We'll mention a couple of them. The Assyrian, we're going to talk about a little at the end. That's overlooked by many scholars. He's called the idle shepherd in Zechariah 11. We talked about that. He's the little horn in Daniel 7. He's the prince that shall come in Daniel 9. The seed of the serpent in Genesis 3.15. The willful king of Daniel 11. And on they go. There's obviously 33 of them. In the New Testament, there's 13. He's the angel of the bottomless pit and so forth. And we tend to use the term Antichrist, which is kind of a strange label because the only guy that used that term is John in his epistle. And John wrote Revelation and didn't use it there. But still, you know, um, he's called, of course, the beast in Revelation 11, uh, 17, and so forth. He's called the false prophet. It's actually two different guys, but you get the idea. The man of sin, the son of perdition. The word of son of perdition is a very strange one because there are those that believe, because of the use of that label with him, that he, it's uh, Judas resurrected. And uh, that's a crazy idea. And yet, when you look at some of the verses, I can understand how they get attracted to it because Judas. When he, he killed, it, it says he, it sent him to his place. There's a couple of phrases in the text that 
cause you to wonder, but I don't really uh, hold that view, so I won't, but let's just be aware that it does exist. Just to review a little bit, remember the 70 weeks of Daniel, the scope, the 69 weeks, we studied that before. There's an interval between the 69th and the 70th week. Verse 26 is important to understand because by that we understand they're not contiguous. You and I are in that interval. That's why it's so important. But the 70th week is what the book of Revelation is really all about. The 69 weeks we talked about how this commandment predicted, the, the, the Gabriel told Daniel the precise day that the Messiah would present himself as the Mashiach Nagid riding that donkey into Jerusalem to the exact day. The one of the most astonishing apologetics demonstrating the deity of Jesus Christ in the Scripture. And this was all in black and white 300 years before the ministry period. It's all part of the Septuagint translation into Greek um, uh, into 70 B.C. But it's this interval I want to call your attention to that you and I are in. That's verse uh, that, uh, 26. And after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be karat, cut off, executed. The Messiah is executed according to Daniel 9. But not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come, that's the phrase that's rather strange. The people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and so on. Well, who destroyed the city and the sanctuary? Jesus predicted in Luke 21 that 38 years later it would be destroyed after his crucifixion, and indeed it was. Astonishing prediction in, in, in Luke 21. But who destroyed the city and the sanctuary? The Romans, right? 5th, 10th, 12th, 15th, Roman legions. You know the story. Well, here it says, The people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, if the people that destroyed the city and the sanctuary was the Roman armies, that, that's an elliptical way of saying, gee, the prince that shall come must be some, in some sense a Roman. And because all of us, so many of us, me included in the early days, jumped to the conclusion that the Roman Empire means Western Europe. That's myopic. The East, we'll talk about that. The eastern leg of the Roman Empire outlasted the western leg by a thousand years. So yes, he may come from the Roman Empire, but we have some other information that we haven't applied, and I'll show you that. So we are in this interval between the 69 weeks and the 70th week that Revelation is talking about, during which we have the crucifixion, and we have the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. So there's at least 38 years in this interval. We've experienced, just by experience, that's almost 2,000. But we're coming up, we believe, for lots of reasons. We suspect that the 70th week is not far away. Now, in Daniel 2, we talked about the strange metallic image of Nebuchadnezzar. We reviewed that several times in the study. In Daniel chapter 7, we have the same information presented with different idioms. Daniel saw, uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream the way it looks to man, the bright, shiny metals. Daniel saw it the way God sees it, a series of voracious beasts. A winged lion, a bear on one side, and a leopard. We talked about that a little earlier, the, the lion, the bear, and the leopard echoed in Revelation. And then we have this last fourth empire that's in two phases. In fact, Daniel can't find a, these others. He, he, one is like a lion, one's like a bear, one's like a leopard. He couldn't think of something like this one. He just called the great and terrible beast that grows ten heads, and those ten heads will be important to us. Um, the trick question is how many heads does this terrible beast have? How many? Guess again. No, no, no. Eleven. Eleven. Everybody misses that. Because you got the ten heads, but we're going to talk about an eleventh. Very key part to unraveling the rest of it. In Daniel 7, the, these, I just excerpt a few verses. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings or kingdoms, which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kings, a four of you, looking, uh, possess the kingdom forever and ever. Amen. Then I would know, it's in, Daniel didn't ask questions about the first three. He was fascinated with this fourth one, and we're grateful because that's the one we're one. We, the other three we know about because they passed. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceedingly dread dreadful, whose teeth were of iron as nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns which were in his head, there's the ten horns. Are you with me so far? But notice, and of the other which came up. See, an eleventh comes up on the scene. Before whom three fell. So you got ten minus three, gives you the seven, and that's going to show up in a minute. Even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that speak great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. This is the little horn of Daniel 7. There are ten horns plus another one, which means how many? Eleven. 
and everybody misses it because the ten horns are such an idiom, they miss it. And I beheld the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. There it is again in Daniel 7. It prevailed against them. Remember in, back in Revelation 13, it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, Money was and the power was given to him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. Why is this such an issue? Because Jesus said in Matthew 16, I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Same word, but incidentally, nikeo, in the Greek, as is implied in the rest of these. So uh, the point really is, is that the church is not part of the saints that we have in view in Daniel 7 or Revelation 13. Different group. You say, Chuck, what are you getting at? Well, let me, let me just pause and insert something here that uh, is important. Jesus said of John the Baptist, no man born of woman is greater than John. That's quite a statement for Jesus to make about a human being. No man born of woman is greater than John, John the Baptist. In his next breath he says, but he that's least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. What on earth does that mean? That John wasn't saved? No, of course he was saved. What does it mean? Jesus goes on to say the law and the prophets Torah and the prophets were until John. See, the Old Testament doesn't close with Malachi. In fact, in the Hebrew Bible, they're in a different order anyway. It'd be Second Chronicles. That's not the point. The Old Testament period, as a period, closes with John the Baptist. He's the end of that dispensation. A whole new thing's going on. Okay, and so I want to alert us to the fact that there's Paul's biggest burden in his epistles is to try, try to get across to us the unique blessings we have as, as members of the Ecclesia. Because he could not grasp, he, he's used to the Old Testament where the Holy Spirit could be given and withdrawn and so forth. That he's given without repentance to us, that we're sealed, you know, the whole concept that we, we take for granted. We don't understand Paul's epistles because we don't, we don't understand the answer because we don't understand what the question is. It's a profound issue. You and I enjoy blessings that astounded him to realize what we have. But that's for a period of time during verse 26 of Daniel 9, this interval. When the church is over, and it will be, there's a number God is looking for, when that's over, it's going to be in, a, in some respects just like it was in the Old Testament. That's why we have the 144,000 sealed and so forth. So anyway, let's move on. And the, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. That's, of course, what is going to happen at the end of the book of Revelation. The, and he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Now we know from Daniel 11:41 there is an area that he doesn't get his thumb on, and that's what we call Jordan. Edom, Moab, and Evan. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and shall subdue three kings. There is again this eleventh king. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, he shall wear out the saints of the Most High. There it is again. And to think, uh, think to change the times and the laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time times and the dividing of time. Here is this strange expression again. A single, a, 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 a singular, a dual. Times is not a plural, it's a dual. Time, times, that's three, and the, and, and the dividing of time, half. That's a way of expressing three and a half years. It comes several times. And by the judgment, and by the judgment, but the judgment is it, and they shall take away his dominion and consume and to destroy it unto the end. It's also called 42, day, 42 months, 12, 60 days. We've been through that several times. Okay. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cogitations much troubled me, and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. So that, that's Daniel 7. Daniel chapter 11 is a, what, one of the most interesting chapters in the Bible. I'll, t I'll show you one, t I want to touch on that. The first two verses, of course, are the Persian Empire. Up to verse 3 and 4, we have the Greek Empire. And uh, from, chapter, from, from Alexander the Great to the end, we have, uh, uh, well, after the Greek Empire, it divides under the four, his four generals. But it's the two, the two powerful ones, Seleucus and Ptolemy, are the critical ones that the Scripture deals with. And from, in Daniel chapter 11, verse, from verse 5 through 35, is a history of these two series of dynasties. 
the Ptolemies to the south, and the Seleucids to the north. What's interesting about this, they sometimes call the period between the Old and New Testament the silent years, the period between the Testaments. What everybody overlooks is those years are covered in advance in Daniel 11. So precisely that the, the cynics have tried to argue this must have been written later because it fits so perfectly if you, get, if you take the trouble to get into it. But in any case, uh, the point I'm getting is that's up to verse 35. It ends up in this historical portion of the, uh, of the uh, chapter with Ant Antiochus Epiphanes. From chapter 35 through up to about 30 to 40, the career of Antiochus Epiphanes anticipates the Antichrist in many ways. When you get to verse 40 to the end, it's clear it goes far beyond Antiochus. There's an overlap, in other words. And that, that uh, as we study that, we learn not only about the abuses he instituted in his grain, but we get some glimmers of what this final leader who's going to, that, that, he, that he foreshadows, is going to get into. But we now, that introduces the whole issue of Satan's super kingdoms. Uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 3, it says, There appeared another wonder in heaven, last, last time, uh, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Remember? Back in... Now, what's interesting is there have been, as, we, as best we understand, seven primary kingdoms. Egypt was the first one, then Assyria, then Babylon, then Persia, Greece, Rome, and Rome in two phases. I'm splitting it because of the discussion in, da in, in Daniel uh, chapter 2. And the second one has the ten horns and all that business. We're together with these seven. Okay. And the, uh, phase 2 is in chapter 2 of Daniel, 7, and of course Revelation 13 and 17. Daniel talks about the four empires. I'm going to say Daniel's four plus one because this last empire, Rome in two phases, is seen as the same kind of empire, but it's divided into pieces and then reassembled in Daniel chapter 2. So you understand why I'm saying 4 plus 1 there? Am I confused everybody now? Are you really confused? In other words, you, from the point of view of empires, the early Roman Empire and the revived Roman Empire are two empires, but they are echoes of the same. You with me? Okay. So that's why I'm calling it for this presentation, Daniel 4 plus 1. But in any case, there's still seven. You with me so far? Okay. You think this is hard. Here, hang on. In Revelation 17, we're going to encounter the following. There are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. You remember reading that when you read the book of Revelation? Okay. Well, the seven kings, no problem. Here we are. Egypt, and kings and kingdoms are the same word. Egypt, Syria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and then Rome in two phases. Seven. Okay. Five are fallen. When John is writing this, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, and Greece are history. He's alive during Rome. See, five are fallen and one is. What's the one that is? Rome. You with, are you tracking him so far? Okay, that's the easy part. <laughs> the other is not yet come, right? Obviously, the second phase of the, you know, the Ro Rome revived, or call it what you will. Okay. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. The next verse is the one that's the corker. That's what led me to try to develop this chart for you. Yeah. The beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Take that verse to your home Bible study and have them analyze it. <laughs> that's a toughie, isn't it? The beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, well, how can you have seven and have an eighth? I suspect that's an allusion to the little horn that's so prominent in Daniel 7, Daniel 8, and becomes the eleventh horn in the idiom of, of uh, chapter uh, 7 and 8 and so on. The beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, okay? And yet, he's of the seven. How can he be an eighth but of the seven? In other words, he's coming out of this other bunch. The beast that was and is not. Which of these empires is not visible today? Egypt's around. Babylon is around. Persia is around. Iran. Greek. Rome. In some respects. There's one that's missing. 
the one that was and is not. I was quite startled to discover that near San Diego there's a community of Assyrians. And I discovered there are groups of Assyrians all around the world, conclaves, of people who are, have been disallowed of their homeland. Don't confuse them with Syria. The area of Assyria is an area that encompassed both Syria and Iraq. But the Assyrians are very jealous of their own identity. And when the Iraqi freedom thing started, they were uh, ecstatic. They don't have an agenda. They don't know how it's going to happen. But they suspect in the turmoil, they may eventually get their homeland back. And I thought that's kind of an interesting perspective. They came to one of my talks. Some of them did. That's where I I was very intrigued with that. But the reason I'm really interested in this isn't for that. It's because of what's in the scripture that people have overlooked. In Micah chapter 5, this man shall be the peace when the Syrians shall come into our land and when he shall tread in our palaces and, when, and then shall we raise against him seven shepherds, really, and eight principal men. And they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod in the entrances thereof. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land when he treadeth within our borders. Micah 5 alludes to this leader who he calls the Assyrian. And uh, the Assyrian, Assyria, the land of Nimrod, the Assyrian. And he's not the only one. Isaiah chapter 10 has similar passages in verse 5, 12, and 24. And by the way, something else that may surprise you, you may recall in the book of Exodus that a king rose up that knew not Joseph, that caused all the trouble. And he's very apprehensive because the Hebrews had multiplied so much they were a threat. So they subjected them, made them slaves. In other words, the slavery started under this pharaoh. You won't find this in the Egyptian chronologies. But in the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, verse 4, he tells you that the pharaoh that oppressed the Jews in the Exodus was an Assyrian. See, pharaoh is a title. The 25th dynasty, the pharaoh was Pharaoh Necho, who was Ethiopian. It's a title. They weren't always Egyptians. The fact that he wasn't Egyptian may be one of the reasons he was insecure with his office with the Hebrews becoming so popular, so populous. Who knows? I'll let you do some homework on that. It's interesting to look at our history and realize that Iran reemerged out of world history in 1906, in 1921 Afghanistan, 1922 Egypt, 1922 Iraq, 1924 Turkey. Meshach and Tubal, if you will. 1930, Lebanon, 1938, Syria. These, these countries that we see in the news all the time have had relatively recent reemergence in history. 1946, Jordan, and of course 1947, Pakistan, and most important of all, from God's point of view, 1948, reemergence of Israel. How interesting it is that the stage seems to be being set for the final act. Egypt, of course, was the Ptolemaic thing. These others were Seleucus. Turkey was partly Seleucus, Seleucus, that's not important. But Iraq and Syria are those areas that were at one time Assyria. You should understand, by the way, that Nineveh, which was the capital of Assyria, was considered a myth. A myth. Uh, Many scholars made fun of the Bible because they kept talking about Nineveh and Assyria. Up until 1849, I mentioned that date because the same, the same year of the California Gold Rush. That's when they discovered Nineveh. And it made history because there really was a Nineveh. They caused them to revise their textbooks. Uh, 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 Alexander the Great walked over it and didn't even know it was there. See, it had, it had been uh, 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 gone to oblivion before then. So the coming world leader, he's got a lot of aspects. <laughs> All through the scripture, he's shooting off his mouth. He's going to be the son of Satan in many respects. People say, is he alive today? Absolutely. If you'd asked me a hundred years ago, he's alive today, I'd say, absolutely. (laughs) Satan's had to have a man in the wings at the ready because he doesn't know when the rapture is going to take place. And he knows when that happens, he has a short time to, to do his thing. He'll be called intellectual genius. He'll be an oratorical genius. He'll be a political genius. He'll be a commercial genius. He's a finance guy. He's a peacemaker. He doesn't start out militarily. He starts out as a peace. By peace, he shall destroy many. How interesting. He'll be a commercial genius, a military genius, a governmental genius, and a religious genius. 
In fact, Second Thess- Paul says an interesting thing in Second, Thess- Second Thessalonians 2.4. He will exalt himself above all that is called God. That includes a lot of things. It also includes, among other things, Allah. He is going to be acceptable somehow to the Muslims, and he's apparently going to be received by Israel. Israel is expecting Messiah. How will you recognize? Because he'll bring us peace. You have to understand how hungry they are for peace. And there's a lot of other verses that come out of this. So we've summarized two beasts. The beast out of the sea, that's the first one. Seven heads, ten horns, heads with the name of the blasphemy. One of the heads has a deadly wound and healed, powered by the dragon for 42 months, overcomes the saints. The earth dwellers worship him, all those that are not written in the book of life. The second beast is out of the earth, subsequently called, referred to as the false prophet in the book of Revelation. He has two horns like lamb, two authorities as if he's, uh, like, like as if he's a messiah, speaks as the dragon, you know, was through deceit. He caused the earth to worship the first guy. He deceives the earth with miracles. We've got to be ready for that. Just because somebody, can you, can you imagine someone raising someone from the dead? We jump to the conclusion, God did that. Maybe. Who gets the credit? It's a question you always ask. See a miracle? Great. Who gets the credit? And of course, he forces the image of the, the worship of an image, and uh, the, 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 we talked about that all the way through there. Okay. Okay. So that's our quick, superficial summary of the person commonly called the Antichrist, the duet, if I may. We have a two-hour briefing on this subject. These are excerpts from that. For those of you that really want to get into it, that's one way to start. But I do encourage you to um, be sensitive to the fact that there is a very prominent world leader emerging in Scripture. There is a danger, I also want to underscore. Don't get so wrapped up in 666 and Antichrist things that it takes your focus off the real one. The guy with whom we have to do is not the Antichrist. I believe, for lots of reasons I did not try to take the time to burden this briefing with, I believe it's a waste of time to speculate on who he is. Because I believe 2 Thessalonians 2 teaches us, if you get into it carefully, that a prerequisite condition to him being revealed is for the rapture of the church to take place. So for us, where we are, to waste time on that distracts us from the person that we should be focusing on. And that's our Messiah, our Redeemer. The one who's really in charge. The one who's coming to take that which he purchased. So for next session... Read chapters 14, 15, and 16. Um, Chapter 14 is sort of like a table of contents for what's coming. Chapters 15 and 16 will deal with the, among other things, the seven climactic bowl judgments. And that all leads to, uh, following that will be uh, 17 and 18, Mystery Babylon and that whole subject. And we get through that, we hit the pinnacle, chapter 19, where we deal with the fifth horseman. We've had four horsemen with the four seals. The big one is the one in chapter 19. Uh, The King of King and Lord of Lords. That's really what it's all about. But for next time, we'll focus on 14, but in order to do that meaningfully, read the next three chapters and uh, understand that uh, we are still, we'll be still just finishing that parenthesis. Chapter 14 is like a a sort of a, a prelude to all that follows. And we'll have then the seven bold judgments and uh, ready for the big event. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. I think it's important for us to really understand that these forces that were in op- operative in the Old Testament and in the New Testament and are portrayed prophetically in these passages are the forces that are in control today. Not all in control. God is in control. In fact, that's the main emphasis of all these studies is God. All these things occur with, uh, 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 they're, they're playing out God's will. But we need to understand that as we watch the strange things going on in the, all the capitals of the world to realize who's really, whose world this is. 
And we need to understand that. But as we focus on that and, and, and develop that perspective, I, I can't uh, emphasize enough that where we should be primarily focusing on is not the Antichrist. It's the living Christ. The one that is coming for us. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for this, these passages. They are indeed in our mouths sweet as honey and yet to our bellies bitter as we realize the troubled times that are on the horizon. Father, we just thank you that you have promised that we would be removed before the time of trouble. This time of trouble that will bring to trial those that dwell upon the earth. Father, we just would pray that through your Holy Spirit you would help each of us to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist. That we might become more fruitful stewards of the opportunities that are emerging before us. Give us discernment, give us resolve, help us, Father, to be equipped to be your ambassadors with faithfulness and courage as the times become troubled. Father, we would just pray that we would be discerning, that you would help us to understand what it is in these pages that you would have of each of us in the days that remain as we commit ourselves into your hands without any reservation whatsoever. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.